Welcome to SLP Nerdcast, the number one professional resource for evidence-based practice in speech language pathology. I'm Kate Grandbois. And I'm Amy Wonka. We are both speech language pathologists working in the field and co-founders of SLP Nerdcast. Each episode of this podcast is a course offered for ASHA CEUs. Our podcast audio courses are here to help you level up your knowledge and earn those professional development hours that you need. This course, plus the corresponding short post-test, is equal to one certificate of attendance. To earn CEUs today and take the post-test after this session, follow the link provided in the show notes or head to slpnerdcast.com. Before we get started, one quick disclaimer. Our courses are not meant to replace clinical advice. We do not endorse products, procedures, or other services mentioned by our guests unless otherwise specified. We hope you enjoy the course. Are you an SLP or related professional? The SLP Nerdcast Unlimited subscription gives members access to over 100 courses offered for ASHA CEUs and certificates of attendance. With SLP Nerdcast membership, you can earn unlimited CEUs all year at any time. SLP Nerdcast courses are unique, evidence-based, with a focus on information that is useful. When you join SLP Nerdcast as a member, you'll have access to the best online platform for continuing education in speech and language pathology. Join as a member today and save 10% using code NERDCASTER10. The link for membership is in the show notes. Welcome everyone to today's episode. Today we had one of the most amazing conversations with a panel of guests who joined us. There were six of us, seven of us. It was the most people we've ever had on it was the, at the same time. It was, it was the wonderful. most people we've ever had here on the show at the same time. Um, and this panel of guests was here to discuss the client's perspective um, when receiving gender aligning voice modification services. And we're just so grateful. Um, we left this conversation feeling so warm and full and it was just awesome. So we are really excited to share it with you. We want to get to the good stuff as quickly as possible. So I am going to read through our learning objectives and disclosures, and then we will cut right over to all the joy. Yes. Okay. Learning objective number one, describe at least two ways clients find gender aligning voice modification to be beneficial to their daily lives. Learning objective number two, describe at least two suggestions a client could make regarding how clinicians may demonstrate their cultural responsivity. And learning objective number three, describe at least one way a client may work to maintain their voice strategies after discharge. Disclosures, AC is financial disclosures. AC Goldberg is the founder of Transplaining and the Credit Institute and received an honorarium for participating in this course. AC Goldberg's non-financial disclosures. AC is a founding member of the Trans Voice Initiative and is a topic expert in gender for the informed SLP. He is a 2022 ASHA Convention Planning Committee member in health literacy, access, communication, and outcomes. He is also on the Community Advisory Board overseeing research out of Boston University around the effects of exogenous testosterone therapy on communication in assigned female at birth speakers. AC is on the editorial board of the Journal of Communication Disorders. Barb Worth's financial disclosures. Barb is a clinical and academic instructor in communication sciences and disorders at Emerson College. She instructs students in the delivery of voice services to all populations. Barb received an honorarium for participating in this course. Barb Worth's non-financial disclosures. Barb has a decade of experience working with the transgender and non-conforming population. Kate's financial disclosures, that's me. I am the owner and founder of Grand Bois Therapy and Consulting LLC and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. My non-financial disclosures, I'm a member of ASHA SIG 12 and serve on the AAC Advisory Group for Massachusetts Advocates for Children. I'm also a member of the Berkshire Association for Behavior Analysis and Therapy, the Association for Behavior Analysis International, and the Corresponding Speech Pathology and Applied Behavior Analysis Special Interest Group. Amy, that's me. My financial disclosures are that I am an employee of a public school system and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. And my non-financial disclosures are that I am a member of ASHA. I'm in Special Interest Group 12, and I serve on the AAC Advisory Group for Massachusetts Advocates for Children. Okay, now that that's behind us, we are so thrilled to welcome our panel of guests. We hope everyone enjoys. Welcome everybody. 
We are so excited to have this amazing panel of guests. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so thrilled to listen to what you have to share and, and learn from you. I'm Kate. Uh, it's lovely to meet you. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a speech language pathologist. I've been practicing for over 10 years, um, and I'm really, really excited to learn from you all today. My name is Amy. I'm also a speech language pathologist. My pronouns are she, her. I've been a speech language pathologist for over 15 years, which sounds like a long time when I say it out loud. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm so excited to having a conversation with you all today. My name so now is I'm going to oh. make, I'm sorry. Go, oh, go ahead, no, this is great. No, I was going to say, you know, um, we should go in order of speech seniority here. So oh. um, my <laughs> name um, is AC Goldberg. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I am a speech pathologist um, and I am also a transgender person. Um, and I have been a speech language pathologist now for almost 20 years. And I am Barb Worth. I use she, her pronouns. And this spring, it will be 30 years that I am a speech language pathologist. So why don't we start with April May? Hi, uh, I'm April May. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I've been doing, um, uh, I guess, gender framing voice therapy for, uh, I guess since last spring, right? Yeah. So less than a year. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm trans femme. Um, that's my intro. Yay. Eddie? So nice to meet you. Hey there. Uh, my name is Eddie. Um, uh, my pronouns are he, him. And uh, I'm a trans guy. And uh, I'm also a visual artist and a singer, uh, musician. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. And Julia. Hello, everyone. I'm Julia. Uh, I go by she, her. Um, I am a transgender woman. I went to Barb's program at Emerson uh, in 2018, 2019, and really loved it. It was my happy space. Um, so um, yeah, so I, I use those techniques I learned there every day in my job as a software developer. Happy to meet everybody. Beautiful. Well, let's start with what brought all of you to um, want to receive gender affirming or gender aligning voice modification. And whoever wants to go first. Um, I can start off. Yeah. So I, um, I started my gender affirmation, uh, like uh, hormone uh, treatment for myself uh, in June of 2019. And uh, I, I had some family stuff going on and I, it was a big interruption in my life got back home and the COVID hit. So I was, uh, I basically, my voice started changing basically during uh, like COVID lockdowns when I wasn't no longer talking to people regularly, just like, you know, not, didn't have those everyday situations to go out and, and practice my new voice. So I, I looked up, I, I thought, you know, I should, I should really be working on this. I can't just let it go. Um, you know, it's a little bit, when you go through such a personal change with something as personal as your voice, like drastically changing, you know, it's, uh, it's emotional you, when, you, when you lose your voice. So um, I, I did some Googling and I found AC and I was super excited because it was like one of the first pages I found was, um, you know, it was a blog article that he wrote. And I was, as a trans uh, person, I, I didn't know if there'd be anything that would be inclusive. I thought it would maybe be very, I don't know, retrograde or something. I, I don't know. I, I was a little pessimistic. So when I found AC's uh, article, I was, I was filled with hope. And so I like Aww. contacted him right away. So yeah, it's good. Beautiful. That makes me so happy, Eddie. I'm just so happy to see you and so happy that you're here working with you is so much fun. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed our sessions together and uh, it was just really helpful. Like at first I thought it was just going to be, you know, I've come from a music background, so I thought a lot of it would be, you know, pitch and intonation and, and things like that, like something from that, but just having that your, your specialty 
and just, uh, you know, te- you really taught me a lot about, you know, like habituated voice. That was very important for me because I had this general sense that, you know, a lot of psychology goes behind like gender, you know, gendered ways that we speak in our various cultures, um, things like that. But I didn't really know. I didn't have, you know, the foundational knowledge. So it was really cool how you taught me AC about that. And it helped, you know, even though I was, I, I still felt like I was really at the beginning of, of my my progress because it you know it takes a while to process everything you learn even in those individual sessions and then you know I was still society was still kind of shut down so I mean talking to my cat or talking to my partner or, you know I was uh mimicking David from Shit's Creek for a while we had that <laughs> oh my gosh that was the best on. oh my gosh that was the absolute best <laughs> you yeah, not wanting so. to lose I remember you not <laughs> wanting to lose your your prosody because um you, you wanted to have that expression in your voice but you felt like in order to stay in the range that made you feel affirmed in your gender that you had to not have those peaks I remember that that was so much fun um yeah yeah, exactly. I mean, I uh, I didn't realize how in my mind, like um, a certain way of speaking, like to me felt more masculine, but it, then it didn't sound expressive. And I've done a lot of work since like it, it that's still sinking in for me. And I'm still it, it's still something like the foundation you gave me is still something I work on every day. Now that I'm out working, I've got, you know, I've got other um, friends who are, are identify as trans masculine, trans male and like seeing how they pitch their voice it's just like that what you taught me plus having now these experiences of like living day to day with this new voice it's still changing a bit but you know having that knowledge has really increased my confidence a lot and it's like I I I went from feeling like oh no like am I ever going to be able to like speak like this is it's a little bit scary to like feeling empowered and you know it's a really good thing so yeah. Thanks again for, I'm glad I found you. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I, we have so many more questions and maybe we'll circle um, back to you, but um, Barb, can I ask one of your clients to answer a question? Um, I just be, in order of arrival, I'm going to ask April May. Um, what, um, what brought you to sort of seek out this type of service? Like what was your, um, how did you initiate the process? Like, what was it in you that wanted that? Uh, yeah, I was actually uh, off a lot of things that Eddie said because I related a lot to that. Um, there was uh, originally I started off uh, by myself, like going online and like on YouTube, um, and it's rough um, doing that alone um, because I think I mean inherently speaking is a very like two person thing, uh, and if there's no one there to hear it, it it can feel very hopeless. And um, so I, I ended up seeking out um, something more uh, professional because uh, I was originally a very extroverted person and I was finding that um, I was becoming less, I, I was becoming like an introvert um, just because I was afraid to speak um, and, and be perceived in a way that was not how I wanted to be perceived, especially because um, I, I started college last year. Um, so it was like coming into a new environment and being like seen as a person. Um, and that was, it, that was my um, my decision was like, as I, I came to school, it was like, I'm just gonna be like the person I am for the first time socially transitioning and then medically transitioning. But um, I, I was feeling really unmotivated um, because I think there's a lot of a lot of things that can really um, bring you down when you don't feel like your voice aligns. Um, simply because I think um, when you're dysphoric and you're transitioning and you're trying to be a different way, it's easy to forget how you look and um, kind of block that out. But it's very very hard to not hear how you sound when you speak. Um, so I ended up actually just uh, Googling like um, voice um, therapy, gender affirming care. And um, one of the first things that came up was uh, my college website because I, I actually go to Emerson and I was very <laughs> confused. <laughs> I found out there was a um, whole 
um, program that was uh, one block away from me. And uh, yeah, that's how I ended up getting into it. And I'm really, really glad that I did. Well, we're so happy to have you. Yeah. And April May um, received both individual and then also group work, right? Yeah, yeah, I was originally yeah. just um, solo, um, and that yeah, was all. Yeah. And then um, this last uh, summer session, I was doing that. In a yeah. Spot. Great. Well, we, we love having you. And Julia, so Julia also um, was with our program for a while and received um, individual and group therapy. And I don't remember how you initially found us. And I don't remember, you know, what initially tell us, you know, kind of the same question. What? What were you thinking about your voice and why did you want to modify it? Okay, so um, so I was a pretty late transitioner and uh, you know, I've been speaking in a certain way my whole life, you know, for decades. And, um, you know, when you're transitioning, it's a lot. Um, you know, I couldn't look really, beyond, you know, beyond two weeks um, without just having so much anxiety. So I pushed really my voice. I always knew I wanted to, try to, you know, um, have a different voice, um, but I really, I couldn't deal with it at all, um, you know, during the first part of my transition. So it all kind of came to a head as I, I went to New York City once by myself um, during that year I was transitioning. And um, <clears throat> I took the bus there and came back the same, that's the next day. And you know, I was trying, so the, the bus, there was some confusion about the schedule. So the buses were not leaving from the station. They were leaving from like a block, you know, this other place that I had to walk to myself. And I didn't know which bus was mine. And I was scared to speak to anybody. I just, you know, I just didn't want to be visible because of my voice. And um, it was a scary experience. Like I, you know, I didn't know who to trust and like who I could talk to and like, you know, out myself as trans and, you know, it just, it was really scary. And eventually I, I found my bus and I just got on the bus and I broke down crying and I'm like, I have to do something about this, you know? Um, so, um, so I did, I put it on my list and um, actually I, I didn't find out about um, the Emerson program. My wife actually Googled around and found it and said, Hey, this looks like a good program. Um, I had also like looked at YouTube videos and I also I bought like a DVD of, you know, techniques and things like that, but it was really hard, like April May said, to, to do those yourself because um, you're like highly technical, you know, in the exercises and, you know, I was just trying to see if like a professional could really help me and yeah, so that, um, so that's what led me to Emerson. Beautiful. And I'm curious, and this is a question for you, Julia, and for everybody, um, you know, did you enter into it sort of with this very clear idea of what you were looking for? Or was this something that evolved along the way? And that's really a question for anybody. Yeah, Julia, yeah. Yeah, so no, I had no, I didn't know what I was capable of, you know, like, uh -huh. I didn't know what voice I was capable of. And I remember, um, somebody asking me like, well, what, what's kind of your voice model? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know if I can sound like her or, you know, or her, um, you know, I just want to sound like me. Um, so it, it was very hard to know, you know, what I was capable of. And yeah, so I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have anything specific in mind. I just wanted to, I, what I really wanted was to be gendered correctly without yes. wear a she, her button on my chest. So yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Anybody As, else? Yeah. April May. Yeah. You might know Barb um, from watching my sessions. I, I have gone through a million variations of my voice um, and honestly, personally change it um, almost daily. Um, mm -hmm. I identify as gender fluid specifically. Um, so some days I am feeling a more, um, usually like a more masculine femme voice versus like a very femme femme voice. But um, yeah, like going in initially, um, just like Julia said, uh, you don't really know what's there, you know, like, like you don't know what you don't know, right? And um, it's like, it's honestly like learning a whole new skill, a whole new like language essentially with like learning how to modulate and like seeing where that can take you. 
um, and then like learning the different aspects of uh, modulation and playing with like, oh, I want to be like breathy and like my resonance is forward today or like I want my resonance to be like back more, but like I want my pitch to still be high or it, like all these different like variations of, of those things can like make different voices and um, I don't know, I've, I've had a wonderful time exploring it. Well, and I also know, April May, you also do some online work and you and you do some D&D, right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's important for you to have a lot of versatility in your voice, correct? Yeah, I um, I do like a little bit of voice acting. Um, I play Dungeons and Dragons uh, and do like other role play games and I usually uh, run that. So I like to, um, well, I honestly just like to use my my transness as like a boon in that situation because um i i a lot of um people i mean a lot of dms can't just be like oh hi how you doing and then in the next like voice go like hello uh, like how are you it's i don't know i think it's a it's a skill and it uh can catch people off guard and um i like to utilize it and i feel comfortable doing so so um, it's fun. It's fun. I, lo I love it. Exploration is what it's all about. We use that that term constantly in our clinic, don't we, April May? <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I you think, embrace that, and I really appreciate that. Yeah. It can definitely be scary. I think until I got to this um, like group work, vocal group, um, the idea of going outside of like what was expected of me, because even like when you're like in a like a, a session trying to like change your voice there's like this expectation specifically like myself as a trans feminist that like I want to like move my voice in a feminine way and and to an extent I really do but um to another extent like sometimes I'm not feeling that way and yeah. um I think it's a really it's a really great tool to be able to um change so fluidly because um, it really just allows like versatility in your presentation um, and makes me feel good. So. And you're good at it. <laughs> so Eddie, I'm thinking you could probably relate to this conversation. Yeah, for sure. Like I think uh, some of the expectations that changed for me was just uh, AC went over, you know, just like analyzing different um, voices in terms of gender, like, I'm, I'm good at analyzing singing voices, but um, when it comes to speaking voices, it's just interesting to, I'm, after the sessions, I, I'm paying attention more to people's everyday speaking voices, how I would gender them just based off of sound alone. It's, it's, it's difficult, right? When you always have a visual and to break things down. And I didn't really realize how narrow my own sort of, um, I guess biases towards voices and gender, just like the actual technical um, makeup of a voice and um, with prosody and, and pitch and timbre and things and uh, sort of expectations I'd put on myself. And uh, yeah, so I, and I feel like I was sort of in a place where I always just push my voice down um, to speak and say things. And, and I, it was hard on my voice and I was like, oh, low, you know, I want to be masculine or whatever. But uh, it's like it was difficult because I was having a hard time expressing my personality fully. So I think that's the ex expectation. I, I wasn't expecting to um, uproot a lot of internalized biases in terms of gender. I thought I was a little more open minded. <laughs> so <laughs> it's been a really good uh, learning experience. And it's actually taught me things now that I'm working on my singing voice more. The sessions with AC has helped me increase that sort of uh you know that analytical ability with singing voices as well because because it was such an internalized bias um you know I'm, I'm able to use it in other ways to explore and experiment with my singing voice as well so that was that was really unexpected and that's just been in the past few weeks that I really have done some some different things with a certain range um, with my like a higher um, sort of breathy singing voice that I was like oh all these there's all these male singers out there or however they identify um, and I, I was thinking about their voice voices in a very specific way and now that I've had this uh, you know these sessions I'm able to sort of 
be more analytical in a way that's like really helpful. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's made me more expansive. So I really appreciate that uh, sort of uh, personal insight and upgrading of my own knowledge with it. So yeah, hopefully that made sense. <laughs> that's totally. so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. I just, the fact that you are a singer and a performer and that you're able to take this and, you know, carry it into that space is really awesome. And the fact that it makes you feel empowered to explore like a head voice or whatever it is that you're talking about at the top of your range. Um, I've recently started doing that as well as someone who's a singer who has been actively kind of not singing um, because of sort of discomfort around the fact that my voice changed and, you know, how do I get my vibe in my singing with my new voice? And I know that I'm not going to center my own voice experiences in this podcast, but um, I think it's really important for people to know that there's a component of, you know, some people who are very attached to their singing voice, regardless of, you know, um, whether they're an actual performer, um, might experience a tremendous amount of grief when, um, you know, when trying to align their voice with their gender, that they can no longer sing um, in a certain way, or that they want to be able to sing and express themselves in a certain way. And um, it's hard for them to figure out how to explore that and still feel aligned with their gender. And I'm so happy that you're doing that. Um, and Julia, I saw your like brow raise a few times during um, while Eddie was talking. Did you have thoughts that you wanted to add? Um, well, just about the singing, I, I totally get that. Um, I used to, you know, like doing karaoke and stuff like that, but I've I've avoided it um, since transitioning my voice. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, I'm getting to the point now where I think, you know, I'm singing in the shower a lot. Um, and I haven't actually, I, I've been meaning to record myself singing to see, you know, really how it sounds. Um, but I think I'm getting close to, you know, that breakthrough. I mean, it takes a while, you know, you have to develop confidence in it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I took, completely feel that. Yeah, Julia, one of the things, I don't know if this is helpful at all, but recording yourself is a wonderful tool. That's, I've done that throughout my whole life with singing, just recording and playing back. I do it ad nauseum. Like I, I have hard drives full of just like singing practice because having that feedback of your own voice is just, for me, it's been a technique that's I've been able to fully like change my voice in so many ways by doing that. Um, and I just really appreciated AC what you said about like grief and, and voice changes because I don't know, as a trans guy, when I had what would be considered a more feminine uh, singing voice, like I was a high soprano, <laughs> very soaring notes. And to sort of deal with that psychologically, that person, that voice sort of had to become a character for me. And it represented sort of, I don't know, almost like a sonic shield for like my emotions. Because I was like, this person, this voice is not what I would have chosen, but this is the voice that I have to express myself. And when you get to a certain place with singing, when you're able to sing from your heart and it's technically, you know, it sounds good and people, you're able to connect with people with your voice, losing that after so many years was definitely an emotional process, but also being, feeling more affirmed when I went through my vocal changes was great. And, um, you know, Julia was speaking about like safety issues, like, you know, as a trans person, being gendered properly is like everything, it's being safe in, in public spaces, in relationships, things like that. And so to have that sort of, it's like, you know, two sort of profound things in tension. You're like, you're becoming, you're sounding more like yourself, but you're also losing something. And I feel like I'm sort of always working through that um, but then what April said about also having fun with just like, being able to experiment because you've had so many voices. Now I've had so many voices in my life, you know, you can have a lot of fun with it too. So it's, uh, I'm really appreciating this discussion. It's like, mm. yeah, it's really good. So, you know, we're, we're sort of talking about all the ways that you, you, you all use your voice, um, all the different settings, contexts, and I'm wondering, you know, how do you work on your voice outside of formal training, you know, so all of you have received formal training from either AC or I or and, and maybe elsewhere as well. But you know, do you have a 
program, a warm up? Are there things specifically that you do when you're um, when you're not with us? And you've talked a little bit about that, but I'd like to hear more. Um, yeah, for me, I, I hope it's okay that I'm speaking again. I don't want to take up too much, but um, yeah, I <laughs> this keyboard, <laughs> I uh, <laughs> having a keyboard, even if it's not a full range piano or whatever. For me, um, having a um, an instrument where you can work on pitch and uh, you know, yeah. I feel like without that, there's no anchor of like notes. And I mean, I'm a musician, so that's my background. Uh, piano, especially, um, I find with con a confidence thing with um, like resonance and tone. If you're not having like for me, if I'm having a tired voice day, it can be a little bit you know, it can affect confidence a little bit, having that, uh, like a keyboard or, or a instrument that you're sort of resonating with. It's, um, you know, your vocal cords are vibrating as well as the instrument and having that sound buffer, you know, and sort of helping you. It's almost like a, a sound friend there, you know, all the notes mm -hmm. and, and you can kind of match that. So it's, uh, it, it, you have something to sing with or, or to even just, you can use it with your, I can use it with my speaking voice as right. well and check where my range is. So sure. that's, that's what's been helpful to me, so. Beautiful. I, I think for me, um, I, I just have this, I am so thankful for this incredible support system with my friends right now, um, where essentially, um, like most of my friends have been there since the start of my transition um, and so they understand that like, essentially I'm a work in progress, <laughs> um, which is okay. It's like, it's okay to be, um, finding yourself and like, not, not know who like you are quite yet or to not, to, to know who you are, but to not be there yet. Um, and I think, I think most of it for me is like, is just this mental barrier that comes with, um, I guess practicing um, and or exploring your voice um, in social settings. Right. And so, because I, cause I think, um, you know, you can sit down for an hour a day and, and practice a voice, but you're not going to get nearly as much as, as if you, you know, you go out to dinner with a friend and you just, um, you just, you just explore. Um, right. And sometimes I tell my friends like, oh, my voice is probably going to change a lot. Um, like, and, and they know that is like, if, if, in one like sentence, I sound one way, one sentence another way, and it's because you know in my head I'm I'm thinking about it and I'm trying new things, or or sometimes I have um, these um, I'm trying to think of the word for them the 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 words you say to get you back to your voice um, mm -hmm. if that makes sense I'm not sure if there's the an anchor words I like yeah, an anchor word. yeah yeah um, and so just like telling your friends like yeah sometimes I'm gonna go one two three four and like just ignore it <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it's just gonna happen um but yeah uh that and something I've been enjoying recently as like a, a warm-up um, for me to kind of find my my like voice of the day, if you will, um, is I'll, I will say hi in like every different voice I have going up and down. Um, at, one is a warm up um, to kind of get my voice like going. Um, and also I, I find that if you like work out the like your whole vocal range, it makes it easier to then like choose a specific one and like set to it. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my, my process. Um, Beautiful. So, you know, so it sounds like we've talked a little bit about warm ups. We've talked a little bit about the, the, the importance of having social support, of having places to practice. You uh -huh. talked about anchor words, which are fantastic. So, little, little things that we can interject to kind of reset the voice. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about use of the piano. Um, Julia, I'm wondering, can you add to that list? <laughs> sure. Um, so, so, pre COVID, I used to commute to work and uh -huh. to go to this thing called an office. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I used to, uh, so I would take the bus to a place and then I would have like a 15 minute walk from there. So I would walk down the street alone and I would be doing my pitch whoops. Um, ah. uh, you know, I would try to make sure nobody was around me because it, I, I'm sure I sounded crazy doing them, but like, you know, they're kind of like, ooh, like that, you know, and, and going up and down. 
Um, and then I would have my AirPods in and I would, I would bring up voice analysts on my phone and ah. I would just talk. I would talk about my day, what I was going to do. And then I would listen, listen back to it. Um, and, you know, that's how I would commute to work. So I'd get kind of like ready before I went into the office um, to do that. Um, <clears throat> so then, you know, then we all, you know, came home to work and, you know, what that, that did, I found a, a really good advantage of that. And that's that I could bring my iPad right here by my computer and I could record myself during meetings um, because we all know that like, so I, I still bring up like comma gets a cure and the rainbow yeah. package and, and I, I read those, but like I'm performing kind of, but like when you're, when you're talking like in a meeting like this, it's totally different. Like you're not thinking about every word you're giving, you're giving the, um, your speech, like only like 10 or 20% of your cognitive, you know, load. And uh, as opposed to like when you're practicing, when you're doing, you know, reading it specifically, you're all your mind is focused on that. Um, so, so yeah, so that was really illuminating, like taping myself during meetings and I would then listen back to it and would, the things I was very unhappy with, I would just say them again and again, and I felt, felt like I got it right. And, um, that was really helpful because it's, because it's those moments when you're not focused completely on your speech, when, you know, what I found that I let myself down a lot during those moments. So, you know, really that, that drilling of those common things that you say really help me yeah. yeah the everyday the everyday words um i have a question i know we're, we're about to run out of time but um i i want um to ask you all sort of how this process and how um you know the clinical relationship that you had um with you know myself with barb uh, with anyone that you may have worked with at emerson how that compares to other types of healthcare services that you've received, um, you know, relating to or not relating to gender, um, you know, what, what that sort of felt like to you, um, similarities, differences, um, you know, um, I want our listeners to be able to, you know, understand a little bit of, um, a little bit of what that felt like to you all. I, particularly with the Robin Center, I felt like this been great. Um, I think when, when it comes to like trans care or just like how like going into a hospital in general as a trans person, um, I think like no event is good, if that makes any sense. I think there's a lot of like um, specifically me in the past going into a hospital and being like, oh, my name is this, but my legal name is this, or them coming in and like asking questions about, you know, transness. And it's like, maybe, um, I don't know, you're my doctor. Maybe you should have known that going in. But um, I don't know, I've always felt like none of that is like up for questioning when I'm, um, specifically going into the the Robin Center so like that that's honestly been a, a big deal for for comfort it's just like um not even just feeling seen but like feeling that like being accepted within the space was never in question you know what I mean like um it's almost like um like when you, when you see people putting an effort to make you feel comfortable that's great but um just like effortless comfort is I think the same the amazing thing as a trans person to experience because it's not something you get to experience a lot so I, I think it's a really big deal that that makes me just feel so happy I can't even tell you I'm actually tearing I'm tearing, up, here. I'm tearing up and I don't work <laughs> yeah. there because it just yeah I know what it's like to experience that it's really yeah it's it's genuine. <laughs> yeah I, I would just second that, like, um, you know, I, I all, all my experiences, like, outside of Robin Center, like, you, you have to be on guard, you know, you have to, like, really watch out for yourself and, like, let everybody know who you are, um, and, you know, still then things go wrong, uh, and it hurts, it really hurts, so um, I never felt that at the Robin Center, I think that's one of the reasons why it was my happy place, um, you know, because it was just, it was, I was having fun. I was in a group experience. Um, 
you know, it was students teaching me, you know, so it was like, you know, being around a lot of young, enthusiastic people and like other trans people. And I just, I, I, it was just a really positive experience among my other trans health that I, that I sought out. It was mm. not the best. Thank you, Julia. I'm curious too, um, and for this is for you, Eddie, um, what specifically do you think our listeners should be paying attention to? You know, let's sort of take it the next step of what advice, what would you say? Like when people are thinking about offering these uh, sorts of services, what do we, what do we need to do better? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I had I had, had a really good experience with AC. I mean, I was yeah. isolated at home and feeling alone, and then I've got AC. And it, again, like it, yeah, what uh, Julia was saying about it, you know, kind of feeling like effortless acceptance and feeling like you know I belonged. It was a Zoom window, but you mm -hmm. know, when you're we go out into the world as a trans person, and yeah, you have to be on guard. You have to any room you're in, any space, you know, you just have to, I don't know, that's how I feel. You're always in a defensive posture. So um, I just think, you know, any healthcare practitioner, whether it's in your field or, you know, otherwise, it's uh, paying attention to content like AC puts out on transplanting, things like that, just really being open, continuing to uh, be engaged in the conversation and yeah, like, I feel like this, like what you're doing is, is great. Just this session is exactly mm -hmm. just more of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. April, I, May, yeah. I was just going to add on to something, Eddie, you actually said earlier about um, uh, in, implicit bias and um, specifically like the idea of um, like, I guess maybe even like internalized transphobia and yeah. like perceptions of gender that we have. Um, and I think my most important thing and the thing I tell people um, when they're like coming into contact with trans people, working with trans people, and maybe they're cis, maybe they're genderqueer as well. Um, I think either way, um, I think uh, implicit bias and um, checking those implicit biases has to be something that's active um, I don't think it's something, you know, you do and then it's done. Um, as, as amazing as that would be, I think um, you have to continue to um, listen to those people um, who are experiencing, um, I guess, like different levels of privilege than you. Um, and just like keep, I guess, updating your internal map of um, just just the ways you you treat others in regards to their identity, especially with something as like sensitive as um, you know voice care. Um, I think an active assessment of bias is a, a huge deal and it goes a long way. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. Great. And I think that it's a good message that we need to continue that it isn't something you just check the box right. it has to be something that we do on a daily basis and on an ongoing basis what is something you learn as like a trans person because um I, I think being trans and transitioning a big part of that is mental because um just like anyone else you're socialized in a certain way towards gender uh and you're raised into a society that treats it a certain way and um, you, you can find this dissonance in your own sense of self because you were raised one way, but um, you feel a different way and, and those clash. And so, yeah, it's, I think it's a big deal. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much for, for just being here and holding the space with us. I know that we're, you know, kind of coming to a close and um, thank you so much for being willing to come on here and like your ongoing just vulnerability in this conversation is really appreciated because, you know, the listener, the people who will listen to this podcast, you know, they're going to be faced with potentially serving the trans population. Um, and I think that, you know, it's of the utmost importance that they understand how vulnerable we are in clinical spaces 
um, and you know how important it is to engage in culturally responsive practices um, because we do come with so much, we do bring so much baggage from other clinical interactions um, into these spaces. And I just, I've had such a wonderful time listening to your voices and listening to your stories. And I know Barb is doing such amazing work um, and Eddie, it is so wonderful to see oh. you. Kate and Amy, thank you so much for holding this space for us here today. Thank yes. you all so much for all of this. I have enjoyed this conversation so much and I'm so grateful for your time and vulnerability and, and sharing your stories with our audience. Really so grateful. Agreed. Thank you all so very much. And it was, it was lovely to virtually meet you all too. Thank you. So much trans joy. I just, I'm feeling so <laughs> much trans joy right now. Like, like so much of it. It's just like overflowing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if I didn't, Thank you so much for joining us in today's episode. As always, you can use this episode for ASHA CEUs. You can also potentially use this episode for other credits depending on the regulations of your governing body. To determine if this episode will count towards professional development in your area of study, please check in with your governing bodies or you can go to our website, www.slpnerdcast.com. All of the references and information listed throughout the course of the episode will be listed in the show notes. And as always, if you have any questions, please email us at info at slpnerdcast.com. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to welcome you back here again soon.